primal chaos. Okay, I'm going to cop some flack for this, but I've never been a Pink Floyd guy, right? That's not to say that I don't think there's value in Pink Floyd. Um, it's just that they were never part of, of my cultural understanding and my cultural upbringing. So I never really got exposed to them in a way that really caught my attention. Most of that is due to the fact that I'm in Australia and in Australia, you know, music is very corporatized, right? We have one commercial rock station, Triple M. We have one alternative rock station, Triple J, who mainly concern themselves with playing alternative music, um, whether that be hip hop or, you know, even indigenous music or, you know, whatever they, they, they're playing over there on Triple J. Triple M typically only ever plays um, classic or contemporary uh corporate rock <laughs> essentially you know um there's not a lot of room for prog and stuff like that there and so it was never just part of my zeitgeist right so you know and i'm trying to correct a lot of those wrongs now and i'm going back through and i'm trying to find these bands that i should have given the time of day you know back in the day and i was too busy concerning myself with other things so you know pink floyd is one of those ones i'm super embarrassed about that i don't have a catalog of knowledge on I know a lot about them as far as like, you know, I've heard money. Um, I've heard, you know, when, when I was coming up, um, a momentary lapse of reason was an album that I think my sister-in-law had that was, uh, you know, I, I played occasionally and had to listen to ice is forming on the tips of my wings or whatever. Uh, when I was working in a record store division bell came out. It's, it's one of those things where I, I feel like it's my responsibility as a music fan to go back and, and, and correct a lot of these missteps, you know? So, listening to bands like Rush or, you know, maybe some more Black Sabbath and things like that. You know, the list is a mile long. I wanted to pick something from Pink Floyd that's, to me anyway, not immediately obvious as a choice. This one came up. It's Echoes in Pompeii, which appears to be in some sort of a, a you know, like an, an old decrepit auditorium from Pompeii. And I would love to sort of see how that connects. But it seems like there's there's what they're trying to achieve here is a very spiritual connection to the past and the grandiose nature of history and maybe being a part of that history or, you know, um, adding the, the gravitas of like a historically significant site, something like Stonehenge or the, 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 the pyramids, or in this case, Pompeii, adding that to the texture of what you're trying to produce artistically can sometimes add a little bit of weight to what you're doing. Uh, and you know, I'm curious to see how that plays out, but anyway, I've talked long enough. I'm going to jump right in, but just before I do that, I'd just like to say that this video is brought to you in part by Encroma glasses, uh, Encroma make lenses for colorblind people like myself. That's why I'm passionate about these guys as a sponsor. If you go there, you can get a free eye test, find out what type of colorblindness you have, and maybe pick up some corrective lenses to help you or a loved one see the world the way it's supposed to be seen. I love how it's in hard stereo. What um what's the instrument I'm hearing on my left ear? Is it like a theremin or something or is it Is that guitar? Is it lead guitar? Because it's really really saturated with effects if that's the case. Man, that stereo image is wild. Oh, I guess guitar, yeah, wow, okay. Okay, yeah, he's playing with volume and stuff like that. That's crazy. Hang on, I gotta, I'm sorry to do this to you guys. I gotta jump back um, and <laughs> take another look at that because, wow. So I just had to also um, pause it for a second, have a look. I'm trying to figure out who's who. So I guess Gilmore joined in 67 and this song was on a 1971 album. So that's Dave Gilmore, right? Um, and Sid Barrett had left by this point. Okay, so all right, let me jump back. So I, I was I was perplexed. So the stereo image is exactly what you see there, left to right. Okay, so 
the sound in the right ear is the keyboards, I, I assume, and then the bass guitar comes in the middle. Dave Gilmore is on the left. Please understand that I have no idea what I'm talking about. So if that's not Dave Gilmore, correct me in the comments. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. All right, let me just jump back. It's a really interesting. Is that like a Rhodes or something? What sort of keyboard is that? Is he using an Ebo maybe? I wish I could see clearer. So help, help me out in the comments, guys, because it's like, to me, what was so confusing is I'm not used to hearing guitar like that. And then it occurred to me, there's a thing called an Ebo, which is a little device that you put above the pickups and above the strings, it's an electromagnet. And while the string typically will oscillate until it stops vibrating, this electromagnet will make the string vibrate basically indefinitely until the battery runs out. So you can play it in a way that it sustains more than is naturally possible on a guitar. And you can get these long sweeping sort of melodies on a single string or, or sometimes multiple strings that will never die out. It will never fade to silence. It'll just keep on playing at that level. And that sounds like what's going on, but I read in the comments somebody saying that it doesn't look like an Ebo. So if you do know, let me know. Um, I'm re really curious. Oh, man, I haven't even seen an Ebo in 20 years. Wow. Okay. Oh, I love how raw that kit sounds. There's that historical significance I was talking about. God, their voices just work so well together. It's got it's got kind of like that sort of mystical psychedelica sort of flavor to it, um, which is you know that's the sound of of Pink Floyd I'm familiar with. Um, if anything, I've heard that sort of stuff a little bit more modernized in their later albums, um, but that's there's just something so cool about it it just seems the the only thing i can think of to describe it is mystical energy right it's this mystical flavor and then their voices harmonize in such a way that it almost sounds like the high sort of descant part is like um it's like it's almost not another voice it's it's like an effect like an analog like they've put an analog effects pedal on there that pitch shifts it somehow you know and then it's because it's a little laggy as well. It sounds like it's wishy-washy and it's just so wonderful, man. It's so organic and just natural. Like listen to. His voice is just so soft, right? There's no like consonant sort of punch to it that sort of makes it stand out. It's just really breathy.
There's also a slap back echo on them both, I think. I think. I love that little chromatic step up there, that's cool. <sighs> I don't know if I'm reading too much into it. There's something in that motion of like doing those really fast sort of slides up to a high note that's kind of like, it evokes kind of like a sensation of like a drug fueled peak out. Like, you know what I mean? Like where if you're listening, you're vibing with the song and you're looking at the slow imagery of the mud boiling and the, the faces, you know, coming to and fro. If you were on some sort of a psychedelic drug watching this, that little note where it just sort of slides up there it's not implied that it's going to happen. It's just a sneak attack, right? And then it, that would hit you in ways that are like very unprecedented, right? And it's this slow lumbering rhythm as well. Like it's... That little bend, man. That would just... That would touch you in a different way, I think. I love how they sort of play with a bit of major as well, right? Just for a second and then they dial it back. It never gets too happy, it's always... Yeah, so that's what they kind of do. It's kind of got this moody kind of lumbering pace. And then they'll just move into just a, like a, the major element of it for just a second in, within the key. And the way they get out of it is then they move up a semitone that's like that diminished sort of sort of thing. And then into like back into that sort of minor sort of flavor again. Um, and that's, it's super interesting, right? Actually, it just sort of takes you on such an emotional journey. Very, very cool. The other thing I really wanted to talk about was like, um, I love how raw this is, right? You know that listening to this and then going to see them in a venue somewhere, you're getting the exact same thing. This is prior to engineering and producing and everything became such a, like a burden upon the natural sound of music, right? So the drums sound like a bunch of tubs. They don't sound produced and compressed and you know like when genesis came through and decided they were going to make really artificial sounding snare sounds you know um things like adding white noise gated white noise into snare drum hits and like long reverb tails and then of course the synth drum toms like do 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 sort of thing this drum kit sounds like just a bunch of tubs the guitar sounds like look sure there's a lot of effects on the guitar but there's nothing in post they literally recorded these guys not to take anything away from whoever produced this album, right? Because this is just the nature of things back then. But the 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 balance and the levels and maybe a little bit of compression here and there is pretty much the magic of what was happening. It wasn't like a million different EQ plugins and and you know vocal processing chains and all of the stuff that's sort of very encumbersome. 
it's encumber it's in I'm not sure exactly how to word that. It's it's uh it's weighing down modern production. You know, we've got the pristine clarity and we can make a vocal sound any way we want to now. And you know, um you can make space in mixes for having way too much stuff in the song rather than having you know four or five people playing their instruments. Um you can hear that they're not double tracking guitars on both sides to have that big wall of sound punch. It's just, you're listening to how the band sounds. And that's, that's really interesting. And I'm not saying that Pink Floyd's immune to all that sort of stuff as well. Um, obviously when they got access to better production, they were obviously going to use it. And, you know, they always still sounded like Pink Floyd from my estimation because of the few bits and pieces I've, I've garnered throughout the years. But I just love how raw this is. It's just classic. Um, and the, the flavor of the song is so indicative of the time that post 60s psychedelia, um, sort of like, you know, where we're trying to sort of elevate our thought processes and create art that, that sort of is more heightened and on a different level and a different emotional experience and connected and things like that. It's very hippie, you know, I don't know if I'm swearing at anyone by saying that, but that's what I'm sensing. I'm sensing like, this is like the progressive thought provoking offshoot of the sixties flower child movement. If that makes sense. Again, I wasn't there. That's how I interpret it. So let me know in the comments, how you feel like what, if you think, if you agree with me, if you disagree, let me know. up in here, wow. Keyboard sound man, it's freaking awesome. Is it a road? Like, what is it? Let me know. Someone knows. They're doing visual effects now. Maybe they should have stayed away from that, but otherwise this is impressive. So, I mean, if we consider that rock guitar kind of originated in the fifties and, you know, people in, in like the late sixties were sort of, you know, like Jimi Hendrix and stuff was innovating and coming up with new ways of playing and the who pushing the limits, cutting holes in speaker cones to get a distorted overdriven sound that, you know, nowadays we can achieve that with extra gain and things like that. Um, 
but like the the fact that the 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 tones, the guitar tones, are so affected is crazy considering how little time there was to to have this much innovation, right? That's super interesting. The other thing that I'm noticing, and again, I may be reading too much into the psychedelic sort of elements of what this feels like. It sounds like um, I noticed that there's no frontman aesthetic going on. There's no in your face vocalist. Like, you know, they re they, I don't think they've any one of them has looked into the camera at any point. It's a lot of looking down at their feet and just vibing in the groove. And, you know, I mean, people are aware that like psychedelics are more about removing the id, right? So like destroying um, your ego so that like, you know, and just, and just experiencing life on, on front street rather than through the prism of, of like a, this constructed personality. Right. And, you know, if you can extrapolate that out, pop performers and front men and stuff like that, they are an embodiment of an external ego that's presented to the audience. Right. And you take all of that away, you obliterate the ego and you end up with this. You get guys who are just producing their art in their own space, feeling their own rhythms and textures and music um, and just uh, experiencing it through their art rather than trying to push an identity upon the viewer, right? That's really cool. Let's jump back a little bit. <laughs> No way his tuning holds up through that. <laughs> Come on. I mean, you're a teenager, right? You pick up a record, you borrow a record from your Uncle Steve or whatever, and you put on your record, you put on your big 70s headphones, and you listen to this song. And maybe you've heard funky sort of music before, and you've heard rock and stuff like that. And then this guitar sound comes in, like, that's just screaming. And it's, it's, it's like the guitar's being wrestled for its last breath, right? It's just screeching and screaming out and hollowing, hollering and, like, you know, like this is why people who discovered Pink Floyd, in my estimation, again, I'm discovering them at 45, people who discovered them in their early teens and their formative years are still fans to this day because they had a moment where they've heard something the likes of which that didn't exist prior, you know? <laughs> Like there's no there's no technique behind this. It's just unbridled experimentation, right? must have sounded amazing in that space man like it, it's one thing to hear it through mics and stuff like that and mixed at someone's discretion but just hearing it in that space would have just been mind-blowing Dive, whammy dive that? Let me hang on. Is 
that, is that the base? Nah, that's got to be Whammy Bar. Yeah, I think what's going on there is he's doing like a... There's a plectrum. Doing like a... Um, some, some, something like that, but he's... Yeah, like that's like a loose whammy. Incidentally, <laughs> this is off topic, but I was on a forum the other day where people were arguing because Steve Vai's guitar tech takes all the strings off his guitar with a Floyd Rose. This is for the guitar nerds. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, people in the comments are all like, no, 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 you should never take off all of the strings at once because the, the tension on the neck changes and it's bad. It can warp the neck and it can do all of this stuff. You should always replace it one string at a time and all this as if Steve Vai's guitar tech doesn't know how to change strings. But then I used to make that same argument. I'm like, I don't know, man, because it'll take the neck a few days to settle back in and, and you know, you, you tune, tuning instability and all this sort of stuff. And my friend was like, that's just not true. And I argued till I was blue in the face. And then one day, uh, a few minutes later, he walks out with one of his Ibanez guitars and he goes. And that was the end of that argument. <laughs> so yeah, anyway. Listen, that was that was a great experience. I'm so glad I chose this song. Is there? I, I know I've probably seen this concert on DVD somewhere, or is there a version of this that's better fidelity, or is it just the nature of the the footage and stuff that they have? I'd love to have seen this remastered from the negative, um, because how amazing would it be to watch this performance looking like it was shot yesterday? It would be mind blowing. Um, one thing that sort of popped up, and I didn't want to pause the song right at that moment because there was a lot of crazy stuff going on. One thing that sort of like, when it gets into that sort of like looped sort of funk groove at the end where, you know, their guitar's completely experimental and the bass is doing things and there's drum fills and stuff everywhere. Um, it kind of got a little jazzy, right? In, in, in a weird way. Like it's not jazz, but it kind of got that sort of experimental proggy jazz feel to it. Um and I brought this up when I was listening to Rush. It reminded me of that scene in uh, Spinal Tap, which, I, again, I haven't seen for years, but this scene always stuck with me. When they're talking about what to do, they get booked at some college festival, outdoor festival show, and they, for whatever reason, they don't want to play a song. Someone may not, may not have turned up or something. I can't remember. And they've got to choose what to do, and someone says to play one particular song, and they go, we're not going to do a 60-minute experimental um, jazz funk odyssey in front of a festival crowd. It's just not going to work. And then they go out and then sure enough, they're playing this experimental jazzy 16 minute song. And it kind of reminded me of that towards the end. Not in a way I'm poking fun at Pink Floyd, but I, it's, it's like, again, I can see where like the guys from Spinal Tap may have got some of their concepts for <laughs> I love it. It was so good. Um, listen, I think I said all I need to say other than you know, fill me in the comments. Let me know the story behind these guys and the backstory of this song particularly or this album. Um, where I can get a better quality performance of this because maybe that exists as well. That, that would be really cool to explore more of this stuff. Um, yeah, thanks again for filling me in. I know you guys always come to the party with that sort of stuff. Uh, that's about it. But yeah, thanks again, guys. If you feel like I've brightened your day at all, feel free to support the channel just by buying me a coffee. I'll leave a link in the description. Um, and also, you know, like, share, subscribe, all that stuff. Um, because, you know, as much as, you know, um, this is kind of a new avenue for me, I'll probably be doing a lot more of this classic sort of stuff, proggy stuff in particular. Um, but the channel is very diverse. So if you're the kind of person who loves music in general, you'll probably find a lot on my channel to appreciate because I go anywhere from adult contemporary classical vocals through to Japanese all-female metal bands to stuff like this to extreme deathcore every now and then, metalcore stuff. Um, pop rock, whatever, acapella, it's all on here. So if you like music or if you claim to like music, I challenge you to check out more of my videos um, and subscribe. And, you know, you know, I, I bring out three videos or a video every three days. So, you know, just watch what you want to watch. If, you, if it's not for you, move on to the next video later on. I don't care. I just love hearing people's feedback. I love hearing from people who are discovering new artists through my channel as well. That always blows my mind. I love to hear from the individual who is finding something, stepping out of their niche and finding something new. Thanks again, guys. Stay primal. I'll catch you on the next one.
Hey guys, this video is made possible by Enchroma. One in six guys and one in 200 women are colorblind. And if that happens to be you, there's something you can do about it. Click the link in the description. It'll take you to Enchroma's website where you can get a free eye test. And while you're there, maybe pick up some corrective lenses. They've got styles to suit everybody and a 60 day money back guarantee. So you got really nothing to lose. Tell them Primal Chaos sent you.